Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Felix, and today I'm speaking with Guy Young, who's the founder and CEO of Athena Labs. Athena is building EUSD, a delta neutral stablecoin backed by Stake Ether. We're, we're going to dive into what that all means. Um, but yeah, first of all, welcome, Guy. So glad to have you on. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, generally, we start more about uh, your personal journey into crypto. You know, uh, Epicenter is mostly about kind of how, how did people get into the space? What were their vision or why are they trying to work on future of decentralized finance? So yeah, why don't we start there? How do you like learn about crypto and, and get into the space? And what did you do before? Yeah, sure. So before crypto, I was working at a, a hedge fund in the US. Um, they focus primarily on financial services. So we're investing into everything from banks to insurance companies, especially finance. Um, and that was across the capital structure as well. Um, I had a friend who was a, a DeFi founder back in 2019. Uh, he introduced me to uh, to Ethereum and to DeFi back then. And it was just something that was immediately interesting to me. And I was uh, investing into it on, on the side of my, my day job uh, all the way through until when Luna collapsed. And uh, it was when Luna went down, Arthur came out with his, his sort of thought piece around how we might think about a more um, secure and scalable crypto native stablecoin. And uh, that's how we sort of landed with with the idea of Athena. Yeah, that's that's a really like interesting pose there, and like sort of origins with with Arthur's pose, and also like he's uh, like a founding advisor to Athena. And, and in the post, if you look through it in the edit, it actually says, right, if I find a team that does this, like let's let's do it. So really cool that uh, you guys found each other there. I guess um, would be curious to to hear actually how. How that went down? Did you like reach out to him? You started building it, and then later, when it had like some shape, you were like, "Hey, Arthur, it's happening." Or yeah, that's exactly right. I thought um, we wanted to flesh out the idea a bit, so you actually had a bit of a, a game plan, an architecture behind the whole thing, and um, you know, a business plan that actually made sense that he could get behind, rather than just sort of uh, putting our hands up. So uh, we put that together, had the sort of design and everything ready to go. And then uh, had a connection into to Akshat, who is uh, uh, the guy who's running his family office, Maelstrom. Um, had a few calls with them and then got introduced to, to Arthur directly there. Awesome. Yeah, that, that's pretty cool. So I also like, I guess, for our listeners, although I, I think m- many people know Arthur is, right? It's like a uh, BitMEX founder and like a sort of person that's very famed in the crypto space around like macroeconomics and like trading in general. And he wrote this post called Actually, I don't know, Dust on Crust, I think. It's, it starts about skiing and uh, kind of draws parallels to, you know, the crypto space. I think in general, Arthur is a pretty great writer, so I recommend like reading some of his blog posts. And it goes into this idea of the Naka dollar, which is essentially like sort of a new type of stablecoin that he was thinking about that is based around uh, derivatives and sort of hedging um, out the price risk of uh, cryptocurrencies. But we'll get into that, I think. Wanted to start because I guess stablecoins like huge topic. You also already mentioned Luna there, right? In general, stablecoins seem to be one of the kind of use cases of crypto that has gotten the most traction. Um, so yeah, I wanted to kind of get your view of like the history of, of stablecoins in the in the space. You know what what did you find interesting and what was lacking? Um, like going from like Dai and and these sort of like more centrally backed stablecoins can you like just kind of talk through a bit how you were thinking about stablecoins before you started like if you know yeah sure so the history of stablecoins goes goes all the way back to to tether and it was originally called real coin back in 2014 um and then they launched officially as tether on bitfinex back in in january 2015 uh so that really the key innovation there was uh, a lot of the crypto businesses that existed were really struggling with banking relationships and being able to, to offboard and to interfere. And really the only innovation that they had there was if Tether could get the right banking rails set up, uh, you only really needed them to be able to do that as, as sort of an off-ramp to, to the real world and then everyone else within the crypto ecosystem could rely on, on Tether as transactional money within the space. And so th- that was really the first use case, which was just a trading pair um, on exchanges and it's obviously evolved um, pretty significantly from from then onwards. After that, I think actually 
the origins of Athena uh, was probably the next example of how a stablecoin like asset sort of surfaced. And so it was actually on BitMEX where um, everything was BTC denominated. So every single uh, instrument that in order to margin uh, the derivative required Bitcoin as the collateral asset. And so if you wanted to get into a flat position, you'd take out a short inverse perpetual against that BTC collateral. And that would, in effect, create a synthetic dollar position out of those two things and heading off. Um, and really, that's that's kind of the origin of the Athena story, which is what we're trying to do is uh, tokenize and export that as an actual product rather than just a trade that was sitting on BitMEX. Since those days of BitMEX, I think you saw a few different uh, evolutions going away from the centralized model of stablecoins. So you saw MakerDAO, and originally it was called Psy, with sin- single collateral being ETH. And then moved moved to Dai, which allowed different collateral types to come in there. At a very basic level, what was happening is you're putting up collateral on one side, and then you're able to borrow the stablecoin into existence on the other. Really, the key moment though for for MakerDAO was in the March 2020 crash, where uh, the system basically became insolvent with what happened uh, with the, the price crash in ETH. And in order to actually remedy that situation, they needed to onboard USDC as a collateral asset there. And so I think really that changed the course of history for for MakerDAO, where they sort of made the decision that they were going to take on centralized assets. And that fundamentally sort of changed uh, the actual profile of, of DAI as an asset going forward. And now you sort of look at it and it's more than 50% uh, centralized assets, whether it's RWAs or, or USDC sitting in there. And then we'll obviously uh, get to Luna. I think um, everyone's pretty aware of, of what went on then. Happy to sort of jump into what we think went right and wrong there. But I think it was uh, it's a pretty uh, well-spoken story at, this mo- at the moment. Right, yeah, totally. I think very interesting to hear that. I guess on Bitmax there was already like this product there, but I guess it was only on the exchange, right? It didn't like make its way into on chain or DeFi, and, and that's sort of what you were you're after. Since that also has like evolved a lot, so it, it goes back quite far, which I guess most people maybe don't know. I think you were also kind of mentioning in some of your materials the stablecoin trilemma. Can you like sort of expand on what's What's the trade-offs that, that stablecoins generally make and then how Athena fits in that? Yeah, well, I think um, trilemmas are used quite a bit within pitch decks in crypto, I think, to make up problems and pretend that we're solving them uh, to, to get a capital raise. But I think actually the trilemma as it relates to, to stablecoins is actually a very real one. So basic idea here is you've got uh, decentralization, scalability, and stability, and you only can really have two of those, those three components. Um, we personally think that it's a pretty unhelpful sort of definition of the world where if you're focusing on these words which are just very broad like decentralization and scalability it's quite unhelpful to actually say are you actually attaining those qualities that you're actually after and so for us we we we're trying to think a bit more deeply about what are the more narrow qualities of each of those uh, three pieces that we actually want to try and retain within uh within our product and uh what we arrived at is within this decentralization piece what is actually the piece that you're, you're trying to solve for here? And, and that is actually having censorship resistance. So for us, that meant you don't want bonds or, or real world assets sitting within SBBs or banking structures in the real world, which uh, a regulator or some other entity can come in and shut down uh, in the space of a day. And so for us, that was really the piece that we were trying to unlock. And it's something that was echoed in, in the sentiment of uh, Arthur's piece, which is you're not actually trying to create a purely decentralized stablecoin because I don't actually think that they exist in in reality. What you're trying to do is create a stablecoin which is independent of the fiat system, and that's actually the quality that you're going for. So, for us, uh, yeah, like I said, it's a more narrow definition that we're going for. I don't think we've solved anything when it comes to the the trilemma that's uh, sort of presented um, as it is, but we we are um, more narrowly defining what it is that we're we're trying to um, achieve. And in doing so, I hope that we're, we're just presenting something that's honest uh, to our users in terms of the type of trade-offs that we're making. Let's get into this in a sec. I, I think another one that's very common, like fear or like concern in the stablecoin space, especially around Tether, is sort of this transparency angle. Is that like kind of related to the censorship resistance since for, for you, or how how do you think about that? Since I guess in Tether's case, right, when you think is the backing actually there? There's not enough audits, and yeah, is that something you're addressing as well? Yeah, one hundred percent. So I think uh, we felt like we weren't leveraging the openness and transparency of DeFi within our product. We'd be doing our users a massive disservice with the way that we put it together. So uh, it does look slightly different here because we are leveraging 
um, centralized liquidity to put on the hedges, and we can jump into the reasons for that um, later on. Uh, but what you do have are wallets where you can see where the collateral is actually sitting, and then the corresponding hedges that um, uh, offset that that collateral. You can obviously just have a read from the exchange APIs to display that. So really what we're trying to do is elevate the level of transparency here well beyond anything that you see, uh, even from like a USDC, where you're off often waiting a month to get um, uh, watered down order, order reports come back. And here you can you can see a real real time dashboard of every single cent of collateral and and hedge that sort of corresponds to that, um, and we think that um, you know showing that to our users and being fully transparent about it uh, is is the way that we we really want to uh, present the product to our users. Right. Yeah. Let's let's definitely get a bit more into this. I think maybe we take it back a bit around you know this actual principle of how the stable coin. Is created so I, I guess in, in Ethereum it's called EUSD, um, and it mostly relies on this principle that you already said that you have the the long asset, the core asset, and uh, short position against it. Can you explain that maybe in a few sentences again for our our listeners that maybe are not so familiar with like um, financial products? Yeah, for sure. And, and maybe just before we jump into that, I, uh, I know we've mentioned like stable coins a few times on this. I think it's a word that we as a team have been thinking a bit more deeply around in terms of how we're marketing these type of products to people without outside the space. So I just wanted to be clear before we jump to the mechanics that um, really the risks around this product look very different to having um, a normal, normal stable coin with bonds basically sitting in a bank account in the real world. And so I think we're, we're just thinking about uh, repositioning the way that we uh, describe the product as something that is closer to that synthetic dollar concept that I uh, described earlier on. And uh, yeah, really what goes into like the, the synthetic uh, dollar idea is you have, uh, in Arthur's case, his idea was long BTC on one side and then short the inverse perpetual on the other. And the basic idea there is that for every percentage change in the underlying collateral, those two positions are essentially netting off uh, so that you always have $1 um, of collateral that's uh, uh, that's sitting there. One key change that we made to, to Arthur's post was was thinking about swapping out Bitcoin for staked Ethereum. Uh, there's a bunch of different reasons why we thought that that made sense. Uh, the main one being that you now have a positive carry to being long staked Ethereum. So you get uh, paid s some yield that's, you know, range between three and a half to 6% um, this year. And what that does is not only enable you to create what we think are really interesting yield products around um, around the synthetic dollar, but then also it gives you a really interesting margin of safety because uh, these hedges often do pay you to be short. So over the last three years, you get paid roughly 7% uh, to be short the ETH contract, but that's not always the case. And sometimes it is negative. So for periods during 2022, when the whole space was blowing up and, and centralized entities were getting liquidated, you did, you did see that sort of briefly dip into into negative funding territory. And so having that that stake ETH uh, return on one side obviously helps for you to be able to cover that risk as well and just create a more secure product. Right. So this funding rate, just to, to go into this a bit more, right? If you're like shorting or using perpetual, you have to pay this funding rate to the other side, essentially, right? And you, you get paid usually you get paid for putting on the short. So it's uh, you can sort of think about it as uh, there's a natural long demand for leverage within the system and crypto is a long biased market where most people who are in the space uh, think it's going up and so they're willing to pay for that leverage to be longer than 1x their net worth. And so in our case, we're taking the opposite side of that position with a short and they're getting paid uh, for, for that. But essentially the what's underlying to what if it's like... Um negative or positive defunding rate is essentially like a market dynamic of like supply and demand for short longs, right? Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you mentioned already, so they, that mostly it's like long biased, I guess we'll, we'll maybe get into a bit more like how, how this could turn out in the future and things. But I guess one other question that I had around, you know, like you already said, you're switching out ether, uh, Bitcoin for ether, but is there also a potential to, you know, have multiple assets? as collateral in in the Athena system, like also Bitcoin maybe, or even like other proof of stake assets? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for us, it's, it's really just a question of sequencing. So um, Bitcoin's obviously got the deepest derivative market sitting behind it, but it's obviously got that issue of, of not having as much interesting yield for you to be able to create a product. And so the way that we thought about this is 
in order to bootstrap something from zero and you know fund an insurance fund that can sit behind the whole thing and ultimately actually just drive demand for it we know that people within crypto respond to yields and that's how you can sort of address that cold start problem in the beginning uh, by interesting people people with with something that has a bit more yield but as we sort of grow in scale and you start to tap out the potential of the derivative to market and stake to Ethereum, uh, you can obviously generalize that to, to look at Bitcoin and then also pr- other proof of stake assets like Solana. The issue here is that on one hand, Bitcoin's more scalable uh, due to the size of the derivative to market that exists around it, uh, but you don't have the yield. But then on the other hand, you've got something like Solana, which uh, yes, it's got a, a proof of stake yield that's attached to it, but the derivative to market is like a 20th of the size of Ethereum. So Really, it is a question of sequencing for us, but um, who knows where where these markets grow over the next three to five years? Uh, but we are we aren't sort of restricting ourselves to to stake Ethereum, are they? Right. Yeah, makes sense. Makes total sense. I think what's also interesting, I guess, is this insurance fund you just mentioned, or like sinking fund. I think it's called in Arthur's post. So, like that's basically for these periods where the funding rate goes negative. Um, can you like expand a bit how does it exist in Ethereum? You know, how are you building this? What like sort of, I guess, portion of the yield is diverted to that? How how do you how are you thinking about the system to do that? Yeah, you can you can think about the the sources and uses for the insurance fund uh, in in basically two ways. So the first is just raising capital. So when we're raising capital uh, at the equity for the Ethereum Labs business, or uh, within um, the if we eventually have a token and do treasury sales through that. You obviously have an ability to to basically raise uh, dollar capital uh, in exchange for uh, for the XL tokens, and I think that that's just a pretty clean and easy way to get um, to get an initial insurance fund set up. Uh, the other interesting piece about this is uh, to the extent that you're generating uh, yields on the product that are above market. So um, roughly this year, this product has been running at around twelve percent unlevered, and that's with uh, crypto rates being um, pretty close to the low of their cycles versus like the real rates in the real world at 5%. What's interesting there, I think, is um, yes, initially you want to pay out most of that yield, I think, to, to users in order to, to sort of bootstrap liquidity and supply in the beginning. But there does come a point where that interest rate differential to, to rates in the real world, I'm not convinced that you need to pay out the full amount to, to keep sort of users in the product. And so there might be an equilibrium where, you know, rates in the real world are at 5, 4, 3, and this product's at 10, 12, 15. That obviously gives you some scope there to be able to capture some of that yield to the insurance fund going forward. I think the interesting piece about that is obviously, uh, as I mentioned, funding is is typically skewed positive, where you get seven percent over the last three years. And if you just look at the distribution of sort of the days of positive funding versus negative, when you include the stake ETH yields, you get eighty nine percent of the days you're getting paid, and you can add cash to that insurance fund, and only eleven percent where you're going to be drawing from it. So. Really, it is in your favor that you're going to be accumulating cash into that insurance fund through the life of the product. And we think it's quite interesting because you're capturing you know, some value within uh, the token, within the product, um, and actually helping to create a more safe and secure product going forward by by capitalizing that insurance fund. Right, right. That makes sense. And, and then I guess if it turns negative, the insurance fund would like sort of subsidize that to get the yield back for a while is that sort of the mechanic that it would yeah well, what it's self important is zero in that in that case so uh we don't want to be in a position like with what you saw with anchor and luna where i think actually creating that inflexible um uh endogenous interest rate there i think was one of the biggest mistakes that they made because you really need um external market forces i think to be calibrating the supply of the whole system and whenever you're stepping in and trying to pay more yield uh, than it's naturally producing, I think it's just a bit of a slippery slope where it eventually leads to breakages in the system um, so at some other point. And so really what the insurance fund is doing there is when it would be negative, you're just getting it to zero so that you know users aren't losing principal in the stablecoin. Um, and then naturally what's going to happen is when you're getting paid zero percent to hold the stablecoin, we expect that some users would, would step out of the product. And in the process of doing so, we'd have to lift the shorts on the exchanges which causes funding to, to mean revert again and back above zero. So just to be totally clear on this one, um, the funding rate is not something that we're scared of. It really is like uh, core to the whole design here, which is we want users to be responding to positive and negative interest rates. And when it does get too low, that means the supply of the stablecoin is too high um, relative to, to dynamics in the rest of the market, and it needs to shrink. And we're not going to stand in the way of that. 
Right. I I read this like tweet where you answered basically like some concerns of like Deacon Spartan there. And I, I found it very interesting that essentially the stablecoin can adjust by like just people withdrawing and then you're closing out the shorts, like you just said. But there's also the the just like general mechanics are not as many people might think, I think, in the that are like scarred from from Luna that it would be like totally collapsing uh at once or it's very very hard to do that can you can you explain maybe why the like a deep pegging wouldn't be like you know from one dollar to zero versus uh, instead maybe going like more gradually losing value in 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 this sort of case yeah for sure so i think the 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 key difference here is that you've actually got the collateral sitting behind the stable coin so luna was obviously backed by Basically, just the faith that the Luna token had some sort of value, and then market makers' ability to stand in and save the system, a bit like a central backward uh, in the real world. And uh, the key difference here is, yes, even if you do have some of these issues, and there are other risks outside of the negative funding, but we can just focus on this one. Uh, even if it does go negative, um, if you look at sort of uh, the bottom twenty-five centile of funding, i.e., like the the worst quarter of where funding gets to, it's typically around sort of the um, negative 5% range. Uh, if you think about that on an annualized basis, if you're bringing that down to a daily uh, attrition that you'd see within the stablecoin, it's literally one basis point per day, right? So it's it's like uh, not even comparable to a swap on curve or a little bit of slippage that you'd be paying like anywhere within this entire system. That's how much you're losing every day if this thing is at like the bottom quartile of the funding. And so really the risks are very different here where if something is going wrong, it's a very slow, gradual, attrition of the principle of the stable coin rather than something that sort of collapses to zero in the space of a day like you saw with Luna. Right. Totally. Okay. I think that's that's very interesting. I think maybe we can get a bit into like technically how it works. I think the, the interesting piece in Ethina's case is I guess it has like this sort of interaction between CeFi and DeFi. So like there's there's elements on chain and there is like a interaction with centralized um, parties. Can you, yeah, you know, just explain how that works um, and why you need that, maybe? Yeah, for sure. So this is something that Arthur was pretty insistent on on his piece, which is uh, the demand for this type of product. We think is is here right now, and it's it's a product that sort of uh, the need is immediate and urgent, and we don't really have uh, the time to be able to wait for perpetual dexes on chain to to grow to a size that would be able to accommodate for it. So centralized liquidity, rough numbers, uh, is between 25 to 30 times larger than what you see on-chain. And part of the issue is that even on-chain DEXs, they're not a sing single unified source of liquidity. So you have Synthetic sitting on Optimism, you got GMX and Arbitrum, you got DYDX doing their app chain on Cosmos. These are all disparate areas and pools of liquidity, which you can't even sort of uh, aggregate into one place to try and um, build this product. And so for us, it was really um, accepting the fact that you needed centralized liquidity in order to get this to scale, to achieve the goals that we have as a team, um, and deliver a product that we think is, is useful for millions of people rather than thousands. And given that fact that you need to, to make those trade-offs, we asked ourselves the question of, can you do that in a trust-minimized way while you still retain the core pieces of decentralization that we care about? And so just going back to that original point that you're making around the trilemma, for us, it was really uh, asking a more narrow question of, what is it that you actually care about when you uh, have your assets on an exchange? And what is it that you're trying to protect yourself from? And for us, it's it's really just, you don't want your assets sitting on a centralized server if you have FTX 2.0 happen again, where you want to be able to hold your assets and make sure that a centralized exchange is not going to basically uh, withhold you being able to, to take them out. And so we've seen really interesting unlocks when it comes to uh, custodian uh, uh, setups that have been put in place since FTX, where you have an ability now to, to hold your assets outside of the exchange but then still use them as a margining instrument for the derivative on the other side. And so what, what that unlocks is our ability to be able to, A, provide the transparency that I was describing earlier, so you can actually you know see those wallets and be able to read into them as a user on the other side, and we'll be providing that in dashboards on the app. And then B, it, it, gives, it reduces that counterparty risk to the exchanges obviously enormously by being able to, to di disaggregate the assets from, from sitting on their service. Okay, you explain a bit more how, how that works, like, these off exchange custody accounts who are actually the holders and like what's technically happening there 
Yeah, so it's, it's brand names that you'd be um, familiar with. Guys like Copper, Bioblocks, uh, you've got Bitco and Anchorage coming out with, with their products in Q1 next year. Uh, but essentially what all that's happening is uh, you have usually, and this is obviously different between different custodians, but you have uh, a key share that's split uh, using MPC into usually three different keys. Uh, there's usually uh, what one uh, pair that's sort of sitting with the custodian, uh, one with the trusted third party, and then one with the client on the other side. And uh, the reason that the exchange can allow you to have your assets in there without actually sitting on uh, the centralized server is that they, they know that we on the other side or a user on the other side does not have unilateral ability to be able to pull out those assets um, at any point. So so long as the rules of that wallet are are being um, adhered to, uh, i.e. you have enough margin in there for the position that you have in that exchange, they have comfort that the custodian uh, is obviously undertaking their job correctly and have the sort of correct uh, checks and balances that sit around it. So I know it's it in terms like strange within crypto, this type of setup, but it's actually kind of how the real world works where you don't have uh, like assets sitting on the place that you're actually trading. Uh, those those functions are kind of different in the real world and, and uh, you know, perhaps fully separated. And I think uh, this is just the natural evolution where I think a, a lot of the times in crypto, we kind of have to learn the lessons uh, uh, ourselves and in a painful way to kind of see that some of the pieces of traditional market structure actually make a bit of sense. And for me, actually having custody of your assets outside of an exchange is, uh, it makes a lot of sense. And I hope that the industry sort of moves toward that over the next 12 to 24 months. Yeah, it's definitely a, a really like interesting direction, probably also useful for other use cases or things that's outside of Athena use case specifically so just to clarify the, the trusted third party here would be then like something Athena labs um does and the actual user so these shorts are also something that does doesn't really involve the user but more like Athena having um accounts on these different centralized exchanges and kind of placing the the hedging sort of um trades on on the exchanges correct yeah so um uh, the user is actually uh, basically sending their assets to this custodian. Um, so the user does not hold the keys to their assets anymore. And that's a key trust assumption that's sort of built into to the design here. So really what Athena is doing is providing a front end where a user is depositing assets. It's being sent to one of these institutional grade custodians where we no longer have control and title over those assets. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit like a user basically just sending their assets to a Fiblox or, or a Coinbase where they no longer um, are holding basically the keys to those assets, but it's programmatic in the way that they can uh, come in and out where if they um, choose to redeem, uh, we don't have an ability to sort of uh, stop them from doing that. Right. Okay. And the, again, on, on the trade and how, like if, if you have to take these short positions, how are you like basically bringing back this information to the to the people holding the coin or, or like, you know, what kind of trades were made? Is this also like something, yeah, you're exposing somehow or like trans how can you make this like sort of trust minimized, I guess? Yeah, so uh, the way it's actually working on chain is um, I, it was probably worthwhile me actually just stepping through the user workflow, but you arrive at the front end and you put in an EIP 712 signature request. So that's you basically re requesting or signaling an intent that you want this collateral to be hedged. Uh, our off-chain servers are basically reading those messages coming through, reading exchange APIs to to understand where can we actually efficiently hedge that collateral on the other side. And then we're providing a quote back to the user which says, you can hedge this at 99.99 uh, D1 to accept. And if it is within sort of that, um, the range that the user was expecting when they signed that request, uh, then we can actually execute. And the key piece here is that we cannot issue the USD to the user on the other side until we have confirmation that the hedge is actually being executed. So really the sequencing here is user comes in, requests a hedge, if it's in line of, with what they're expecting and where we can execute, we execute and then issue the USD on the other side to the user. So And and why does the user do that? He wants the 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 USD to like a uh, USD to like earn the yield on it or what's their yeah, sort of motive? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um I have sort of um uh, there is two different types of users within the system. There's like uh, w what we can call retail users who are just wanting to swap in from dollars to dollars. And so the the front end that we're providing there is basically just um, a front end that reroutes people into liquidity pools on chain. So you'll arrive with USDC, USDT, whatever stablecoin, and all you're doing is actually swapping it in a curve pool into our stablecoin. 
Uh, but then in order to achieve what I've just described there, we need to abstract away all of the complexities that I've just described to you um, previously. And the sort of mechanism that, that, that allows for that is we have market makers who are doing the mint and redeem arbitrage against that curve pool. So you can think of the flow as a, a user comes in with $100,000 to swap into USD. That slightly imbalances the price of USD versus USDT in the curve pool. And when that becomes imbalanced, a market maker now has an arbitrage opportunity to pick up that asset and come to our mint and redeem contract and add new assets into our system. And it's actually the market makers who are doing that re request for credit that I was just uh, describing where um, they're performing the arbitrage and keeping things in line with the dollar over there. So uh, really that complicated system that I was trying to describe there, that's only really relevant to how a market maker is interacting with us. And uh, retail flow basically just looks like a, a Uniswap transaction that, that just hits an AMM on the side. All right, makes sense. And then maybe, I guess in... In terms of like risk, we, we talked a bit about the funding rate, um, but now you're like interacting with all these centralized exchanges and like sort of other players. Can you expand what sort of additional risks exist there and, and how they might impact like uh, stablecoin holders? Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, as you said, I think we've, we've covered the negative funding one a bit. Uh, the other one was just around credit risk to the exchanges, right? Um, we thought we made a pretty thoughtful decision in terms of how we disaggregated the the assets from the exchange and, and tried to help alleviate some of that concern. But it doesn't take the risk down to zero. The risk that still exists there is you still have the derivative instrument sitting on the exchange. And so if you just play through that scenario of an exchange going down on the other side, let's say you've spread the portfolio. Um, there's five exchanges, you, you spread it uh, you know 20% across each exchange and one of them goes down. Let's assume that on the day that that happens, ETH is probably going to be falling, you know, 10, 20% on that day. Um, so you're going to have a hedge that is massively in profit on that day where you might have lost the PL to that hedge uh, that corresponds to the collateral that's still sitting outside of there. So you still retain some of the credit risk um, on the hedge side of the whole thing, but you have an ability to basically move that down to, um, to basically daily settlements of the PL. So you can just, you can keep that risk to, just one day of PL that you'd have on that exchange. Uh, and so really what you'd be losing there is 20% of 20% um, in terms of the whole portfolio. And so, yes, we haven't sort of reduced that risk entirely to zero, but like with an entire exchange going down, we think we, we've sort of boxed up that risk um, reasonably well um, for for yeah what we just described there. And then um, I think one other piece just to mention here as well is uh, there is like a li liquidity element to this as well. So you're obviously tapping into uh, perpetual markets that um, you obviously need to be liquid as people come in and out of the product. Uh, this is something that you can just think about conceptually very similar to slippage of people coming into a Uniswap transaction. When you want to come in and out, there's obviously a cost to doing so. It's the same way that there's a cost to, to open and close a hedge. Uh, perp markets are you know considerably deeper than spot markets. And so these this is like low single digit type basis point. Uh, of impact, but if like everyone wants out at the exact same time and you have thin liquidity at that moment, um, there might be you know higher slippage for people to get in and out. But uh, really, it's a cost of liquidity, and it's something that we can't uh, try and disguise in any way. I think we just need to be clear with our users that it does exist, both on the way in and the way out. Right, and and I guess yeah, just in to clarify, if there is like the scenario that one exchange kind of can't honor the short or like whatever happens to the funds on this exchange um this impact is kind of socialized across all the say coin orders and not like by the specific user that did the trade right like it's it's kind of yeah that's correct yeah yeah okay cool so yeah really it's a lot about um working with the exchanges that are like trustworthy also and and managing how much goes where is there like some sort of yeah like are you just using like the best rates or like how are you managing what liquidity goes where in terms of the exchanges is it also like kind of risk adjusted in, in some way uh, based on your judgment of the exchanges or something like that you know i don't know what, what one could use but have you thought about that yeah, so in the beginning, I think you can do a bit more solving for the best return uh, because you're small and sort of not, um, you know, impacting the funding rates and the liquidity on single venues. But I think in an end state, really, this whole thing is going to be determined by 
you know, global risk parameters that sit around how much of each exchange you're, you're willing to, to be a part of. And so in the end, it's just going to look like the market share of the entire market, if that makes sense. So if we significantly diverge from that market share, I think that there's something going wrong in terms of our risk controls. Um, and so, yeah, you, you can do a bit of solving for, for yield in the beginning, but then uh, beyond that point, when you get too big, you kind of lose the ability to do that. Um, and then just in terms of the exchanges itself, yeah, we, we are only working with exchanges that we as a team feel comfortable. Uh, there is sort of uh, different alerting systems and stuff that are attached to the custodial services we use as well, uh, where they're obviously uh, flagging for any any type of activity that looks slightly suspicious or on-chain wallet movements, that type of stuff. Um, and so we do lean on on some of the third-party infrastructure providers there as well um, who, who can help with that. I, I, I would just sort of circle back to the same point though, which is, if an exchange is going down, you have sort of isolated to, to just one day of hedged uh, risk, not even collateral. And so that number on on the you know example we're giving, if it's an exchange between 10 to, 10 to 20% of the entire portfolio, only a single day, and there's a 10 to 20% nuke in ETH price, it's only somewhere between you know 5 to 1% of the total portfolio that you'd be losing. So again, it's not something that sort of takes the whole thing to zero. And a 5 to 1% is is a type of risk that you can actually cover with insurance funds as well. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. I guess the other this is like specific to the exchanges, but I mean custodian, there could I guess there is a little bit of a risk maybe with these MPC wallets. That would be the only way how collateral could be lost in case there is like something wrong with this MPC setup on in some ways, right? Yeah, that's correct. I, I would also just say that the custodians that we're using um, have not actually lost a dollar to date. So we compare that to 7 billion lost in DeFi in the last three years, north of 15 billion in CFI. Uh, if you just like empirically look at the data and say, where has it been safer to leave your assets in a smart contract or with the custodians that we're working with, uh, the data says uh, it is a custodian. So yes, it's not, um, it, it's not perfect in terms of reducing risk to zero, which I think is impossible to do with any of these things. It's really just looking at... Um, uh, how risky is it relative to other things? And I think the data gives us a bit of conflict around that. Right, yeah. I do I do like that approach a lot to like actually look at the state and the current numbers. I think also like in terms of the open interest and, and the choice you have made there and like the analysis. So I'm also recommending we will probably put it in the show notes, like some of the kind of data that you have around that, which which I also found very interesting to see, just like also the differences between open interest and centralized exchanges versus like the DEXs. So I guess, yeah, maybe also like a question around that. Do you think, because right now, I guess it's like 20x centralized exchanges. Do you, do you think at some point, like more and more will move to decentralized, like sort of perpetual protocols um, and, you know, what is needed for that or like kind of why, why are people choosing centralized exchanges still over DEX? Is it still like user experience type of questions or um, yeah, liquidity type questions that if at some point they flip that would change or you know is there anything else there yeah sure so um we are we are working with synthetics so we put out a, a bit of a post where we described um uh how we're thinking about integrating with them so uh that is absolutely the intention that we sort of start where liquidity exists today and then uh walk back to decentralization after that and uh i am bullish on the on-chain growth of derivatives i think it was something that a lot of investors and a lot of people were quite excited about last cycle, but actually I think the infrastructure wasn't really there uh, to enable it to, to, to grow to the size that people were expecting. And so now really like derivatives and, and being able to run um, off-chain order books, it, it really does take, um, uh, not even an L2 can really handle it. Like if you speak to DYDX and their decisions to go and build on an app chain in Cosmos, they weren't even happy with the way uh, that um, an L2 or even Solana could, could cope with the capacity that they needed. And so uh, I, I do think we've sort of got there now and are ready this cycle in terms of infrastructure to allow uh, those things to grow. Really, it does become a question of liquidity and, and it is quite difficult, I think, to unseat these big pools of liquidity on sexes where ultimately market makers and big traders um, have shown that they're comfortable to, to trade and it does take quite a big step for them to move onto new chains um, and applications sitting within DeFi. Yeah, that's... That's super interesting. I think yeah, it will be interesting to see how it plays out in, in the next cycle. And after that, if like actually liquidity kind of moves more on chain and I guess also how your design then adapts, because I guess for now you are, are you supporting any 
the exercise, I, I think synthetics, right? Um, you already announced, but it's essentially like, again, like a pragmatic sort of thing where you're like thinking about the sequencing of how to roll things out. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I think also from an engineering perspective, it's um, a lot easier to integrate with C5. Um, it's sort of one type of model and you can just plug in different exchanges and then actually picking different chains, different um, deep by applications to get into just takes quite a bit more engineering lift on our side. Um, but we are really excited about what we see with a bunch of the different DEXs on chain. It just sort of takes time, A, for them to grow to a size um, where they're more comparable to sexes, but then B, also for us to just do the integrations on our side. Um, I do think it's pretty interesting, though, if you start to think about the different ways that Athena can plug into different DeFi applications, it's not just uh, perpetual DEXs. So if you think about the core product itself, where you're capturing uh, a yield and tokenizing it within a product where you've got censorship-resistant collateral with an embedded crypto-native yield uh, coming from the two sources that we described earlier, what's really interesting there is that you're actually importing a new source of yield on-chain for DeFi where at the moment all of DeFi is basically just running on staked ETH, right? And there's no way of extracting any more return or bringing any more yield to, to DeFi. Your ability to import uh, that that 7% return that I described from shorting ETH perhaps from CFI into DeFi, then unlocks a whole sort of a new suite of things that you can start doing when you compose with that asset into different applications. So just one example I could give you here is if you look at a MakerDAO or a Frax, if they're filling their entire balance sheet and the backing for their own stable coins, uh, with RWAs, what happens when rates start to go from 5 to 4 to 3 and this product is sort of sitting there at 12, does it become quite interesting to think about, you know, diversifying away from pure centralized assets to something that's a bit more alternative as a as what we're calling it, an internet bond. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's really beyond just trading on DEXs, but it's actually, we hope, delivering a really interesting bond-like asset for the rest of DeFi. Right. Yeah, that that's super interesting. I think you also... Yeah, I guess maybe maybe let's go a bit into that as well, right? Like now it's very based on um, perpetuals, but there is also, I think, some ideas around like fixed rate and, you know, like kind of using futures or, or options maybe to to also have, can you explain how that would work and what would what it would unlock for, or this sort of concept of the internet bond or, or for anything, I guess, at, at large or in the space? Yeah, for sure. So you can you can think of the hedge that we described earlier, where your long spot staked ETH on one side and then short to perp. Those are both variable rates of, of uh, return. So the perp is, is resetting every eight hours and the interest rate is changing. Uh, you do have traditional futures contracts within crypto as well. They're quite a bit less liquid. So roughly the, the size of the market is ten uh, a tenth of, of the size of the perps market. But what you can do there is actually hedge the collateral out for a predefined uh, maturity date. So you can say, uh, I want to look out from now until June of next year and lock in what that um, that the, the how much you're going to get paid for that hedge on the other side. And so what you're able to construct there is actually fixed return dollar denominated instruments where you're putting down the stake teeth collateral and saying, I know I'm going to get paid 4%. And then all of that conversation that we just described around negative funding and all those other elements, it completely drops out of the equation because you know you've locked in that collateral as a dollar format with the return. And so again, Think about that asset. If you look at some of the treasuries within DeFi, uh, that's a pretty interesting proposition, right? Where you can go to these treasuries, which are sitting on hundreds of millions of dollars of either USDC or ETH, and say, "Do you want to buy into something that has, you know, a fixed rate of return of whatever it is, uh, six, eight percent over the next six months?" And you can actually take that yield and use it for sort of working capital and paying employees within the down stuff like that. So uh, that's we think a really interesting asset to be bringing to DeFi and the concept of like fixed rate. Is really started to to you can really unlock it when you're using an asset of the size of stake ETH and then also uh, the futures market across the entire uh, sex space. Uh, so yeah, that's one piece there. And then one other um, item that you sort of called out there, which I can just jump into a bit more detail, is thinking about this idea of repo repo financing. So if you have uh, the assets that we're describing now with with the returns that we described are all obviously on an unlevered basis. Um, but to the extent that you have an interest rate differential between that asset and your ability to borrow dollars in the rest of DeFi at a different rate. So, you know, if Aave uh, is 3 to 4% to borrow USDC or USDT, if you can put up this asset and start to lever it up uh, by borrowing USDC against our uh, USD asset with a yield, and you're getting paid 12 on the asset side and borrowing at 3 or 4, that post leverage return starts to become really interesting when you start to loop it up to 5 or 10, 10 times over. So, 
Um, again, it's a bit of sort of financial engineering that I think is unlocked uh, by having an interesting base layer of yield that we're obviously importing from CFI into DeFi. Right. If you were to do that, does it, I guess it would impact maybe like more people do it. It might push down the yield of EUSD also like to like go closer to the borrowing rates of these money markets elsewhere. That, that's exactly right. And there's like a, a big conceptual question around what we're doing and what is sort of the equilibrium interest rate of this entire thing, right? Because right now you're getting paid too much to put on uh, this uh, long spot and, and short per position. Um, eventually it has to sort of come down to some equilibrium level. What does that equilibrium level look like? Uh, it's probably where borrowed dollar costs in the rest of the market um, start to converge with that number. So if you can borrow dollars at three or four, like put away the complication of everything else with all of the custodial risk, all of the uh, credit risk, all that type of stuff. And there's just a very clean way to borrow dollars and put it into what we're doing. Those two interest rates should sort of like come together. But really the outcome of those two things coming together, what needs to happen is the supply of our stablecoin needs to go through the roof, right? Um, and so really that that repo thing that I described there is just a really clean mechanism within DeFi uh, to allow people to basically force uh, that in interest rate differential to converge. Right. Yeah. I think, I think that's a very interesting like case for like the supply growing actually. And when there is like so much demand, let's say like scenario that you, you, it does succeed and there's like a huge supply. Now it does impact the, the funding rate. Do you would, yeah, I guess that's also like an equilibrium where one is not clear where would that lie then if, if there's like just much more short demand from your end. Um, through the, such a product, right? Yeah, and um, I just want to be clear on it, which is um, if we do reach this theoretical equilibrium, and this like we know in crypto, things never like actually land on their theoretical like equilibrium. It's always just like a mess between here and there. But really, if you are getting to that stage, that is just an outcome of us doing our job correctly, right? Which is we've produced a crypto native stablecoin that is um, large and it sort of reached the the size that the market can actually handle, and so. Really, it's it's not something that I'm like awake and worrying about. If you sort of get to that size, it's actually something of yeah, you've sort of succeeded in what you set out to do. Um, and if you do get to the stage where it's zero, it will start to push down the funding. As I said, it's part of the design where if that is starting to happen, it means that the supply needs to shrink, and we need to get to a new equilibrium of, of supply after that. So um, it's it's something. The things I stress about are have I put the appropriate measures in place to cover for the tail events i.e. the insurance fund is that, you know, appropriately sized relative to the whole thing. I'm not like awake worrying about if this thing caps out at three, four, five, or 10, it's going to cap out where it caps out. And that's just sort of like the market dynamics uh, determining where, where that is. All we we need to do is put in the infrastructure for us to get from from zero to that point, and then make sure that we're covering the the tail risk appropriately to create a product that's as safe as, as possible for our users. So um, I think it's interesting to discuss these theoretical outcomes. I don't think we ever landed them because it is crypto. And then I would also just comment, it's not something that um, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about. I just need to think about sort of the tail risks. Right, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think why, it, I guess it's interesting to discuss is that if we think about, yeah, I guess stable coins like really being used in the actual economy and other things, then you want it to be like quite a big supply. I guess that's where generally the scalability or like the lack of in maybe like things like die come to mind or, or people are like maybe thinking about and that's what's probably like the promise of, of Luna for for a second there and that it's like very scalable and I guess you know you can't have free lunch and uh, that definitely showed so um, yeah I, I think that's a very yeah uh, pragmatic like sort of approach and makes sense right it first look out for the that it actually works on, on the smaller scales too um, I do think yeah it's also interesting that I guess just to know that there's like obviously it's kind of obvious that there's like long demand for crypto uh, bias and maybe that in the future will also change but I guess you know also Ethereum will evolve and who knows what what else what other assets you will will put uh, be able to collateralize in the future or also like other proof of stake assets or who knows what what this will turn into do you have any thoughts about that like you know could you do like a similar mechanism with like non-crypto assets or is that like not not on the table for now or something like that 
yeah, you've got like, uh, you obviously got features that exist uh, on equities in the real world. Um, they don't have perps in the same way that we see it in crypto. There's, uh, perps are very much a crypto um, specific phenomenon. Um, but what, what you could do, and this is just conceptually speaking, uh, it's not something that I put like a ton of thought into, is uh, if there is a positive uh, carry or like a contango within um, the equities market as it relates to a single equity, um, and someone sort of allows you to collateralize that with an Apple stock or whatever. Yeah, really, uh, the whole concept here is you just got one asset as a spot thing on one side and then a derivative on the other side that offsets it. So, so long as there's sort of contango within uh, the derivative instrument on the other side and you're getting paid to put on that position, uh, you can do that. Um, I think uh, you're thinking further ahead than than I ever have with, with this thing. I think we're just pretty focused on, on getting something that uh, sort of works and is useful for the crypto space uh, to start with. Awesome. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, maybe we, we went a bit like very far there. I, I thank you so much for, for coming on and like explaining, you know, how, how it works and bringing like, uh, all the pieces together. I, I hope this was a useful episode for our listeners. Um, yeah. And maybe yeah, as a final sort of question, like where, where can people learn more about Athena? How, what's the roadmap like, things like that. Yeah, sure. So the, the website's Athena Delphi. Uh, the, the Twitter is Athena underscore labs. I'm on uh, leptocratic underscore, which is a bit uh, cryptic. So hopefully we can uh, throw it in the show notes. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of the roadmap, uh, launching uh, basically in a couple of weeks, uh, slow sort of rollout of the product to internal um, parties where we're just going to be doing some testing with internal capital. And then the idea is that we slowly start to roll it out uh, the month after that to, to the public to be able to come in and uh, test the product. So, yeah, uh, excited to get it out and uh, hope that everyone is, um, likes the product as much as we do. Awesome. Yeah, very excited to see how the user experience goes and how the launch goes. And, like, yeah, congrats. And, yeah, thanks for coming on and see you soon. Awesome, man. Thanks for the time.